Hi everyone, this is your first lecture for chapter 10. So we are going to do two things this week. We're gonna talk about the concept of legal analysis and we're also then gonna move on to chapter 10 and talk about the exclusionary rule. Um, you may, may see some references to chapter 11 also. We are going to maybe touch on chapter 11 in one slide. So if you just wanna look through it real quick and um, mind tap and read it or skim it, you don't have to read it like really detailed and we're not really gonna to go too much into it. We're just gonna kind of touch on what chapter 11 says, but mostly we're gonna focus on chapter 10. So you don't have to do mind tap or anything for chapter 11. Um, mostly you're gonna focus on chapter 10. So we're gonna start out first with the concept of a uh, legal analysis. So I am going to share my PowerPoint with you and we're going to start by talking about legal analysis, okay? Sorry, I had to get it ready. Okay, here we go. So we finally finished all of the pretrial stuff last week and now we're moving on to actual criminal procedure law. So what we're going to do is we're gonna talk about the consequences when police violate constitutional rights. So we talked about what our constitutional rights are and how they form and shape criminal procedure law. So now we're gonna talk about what are the consequences when um, police violate those laws. Now, before we get to that, we're going to talk about the concept of legal analysis. Legal analysis is the concept that you take precedent and use stare decisis to apply to new cases. So we're going to do that. We're gonna learn a specific method on how you're gonna answer your homework and your problems on your exams using this legal analysis method. And it's a very systematic method that you use. So you make sure that you include all the different parts that are necessary in your answer. So when you're talking about legal analysis, it's always really good to think about which path would you take? Okay, so this is talking about when you are faced with the situation, you're going to have different precedents that set forth what choices you can make. First thing you have to decide is which path do you want to take? So when you read your scenarios, you're gonna to have to think about the different court cases that we've talked about in class, and you're gonna to have to make a decision, how would you answer this question based on those decisions. So remember we talked about analogous and distinguishable. If you make the decision that it's exactly like the cases we've covered in class, you're gonna take one path and argue it's analogous and you're gonna follow the same path. Where if you think it's different, you're gonna argue it's distinguishable and you're gonna take the other path. So that really is going to be up to you. You're gonna to have to decide, to decide which path you want to take. And that's really gonna to have to be based on your interpretation of the cases and how they affect the situation. There may, may, may or may not be a right or wrong answer. You just have to support it with the precedent that we learn in class. So you wanna make sure you use that to support what you're saying. Okay, so how are we gonna do that? We're gonna use the legal analysis method called the IRAC method. And this is what you're going to use every time you write a case study for me. You're gonna use this method. So the IRAC method is four steps. The first step is identify your issue and give me a summary of what happened in this case, okay? So remember how we talked about the issue when we talked about briefing a case. What is the court trying to answer? It's the same thing with IRAC. So if you read a scenario that Officer Joe pulls somebody over, um, pulls them out of the car and searches the car and then searches the passengers in the car and the passengers arguing there wasn't probable cause to search the passenger. Your issue is gonna be, was it lawful for the police to search that passenger without probable cause? So you're gonna to have to identify what is the court trying to uh, um, determine here? And a lot of times I'm gonna give that to you in a sense when you read the scenarios, I'm gonna give you questions at the end. So you can kind of use those questions to form your issue. What is the court trying to decide? And then just give me a brief summary, a couple words of what the case is about. Officer oh, Smith or Joe or whatever I said his name was, pulled a car over for, and you know searched them, blah, blah, blah. So just a quick summary of the facts of your case. So that's the issue. The next letter is R. 
R is rule. This is just stating what constitutional amendments you're going to be governed by and which court cases you are looking at as precedent. So here you're gonna say the fourth amendment controls what the officers do and the court cases are going to be, and then you're gonna list the court cases that we talked about in class um, that would control your answer. The next part is what we're gonna call your analysis. Now throughout the semester, I'm gonna give you different flow charts that you're gonna to use to perform your legal actual analysis of how this case is would apply in certain situations. So once you state what course cases you're gonna use as precedent, then you're gonna get into your whole analysis section. You can't really use a whole analysis section yet because we haven't gone into a lot of the flowcharts. So right now you're just gonna make your argument of why your side should win, okay? And then your conclusion is just restating your issue, what you think the court should decide, okay? So that is the method you're going to use, issue, rule, analysis, conclusion, and it's IRAC. So here's an example. Um, of how you would do it. First, you would state your conclusory introduction statement. So in my example, Officer Smith unconstitutionally searched and seized evidence from the passenger in a car, okay? So that's it, you're just stating your conclusion as your introduction. So you're gonna always argue in here for the defense. This class is taught from a defense perspective. And you're gonna argue why the police did something and why it was unconstitutional. So you're gonna state that conclusion and then you're gonna summarize the fact, Officer Smith, blah, 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 blah. Then you're going to locate your cases, like I said, the amendments and any court cases that deal with search and seizure that you think should apply. And then you're gonna give your argument of why they apply. And in this analysis section, that's when you're gonna argue if a case is analogous or distinguishable. So you would say in Brown versus US, um, the court found searching a passenger in a car was unconstitutional. So then in your analysis part, that would be your law or your rule, your R for Iraq. And then the next section you would say, since the court case found in Brown versus US that searching a passenger um, in a passenger in a car was unconstitutional, this court should also find it unconstitutional. In this case, they also searched a passenger without probable cause. Since they found that in Brown, it's analogous to this case, they should find it in here. So now you're going to make your passioned argument of why you are right. And then you're going to state your conclusion, which is almost identical to your, ident your intro statement. You're just gonna reword it, right? Therefore, the police conduct of searching the passenger without a warrant and probable cause was unconstitutional. You state your conclusion, okay? So remember Roshan. So if you remember when we briefed a court case, we used the case called Roshan versus California. And just a reminder, the issue was whether the due process clause of the 14th Amendment was violated when police forced the defendant to regurgitate the capsules in the hospital. The Supreme Court held that it was shocking and it therefore unconstitutional violation of the 14th Amendment when the police made him regurgitate the pills, okay? So that's what the Roshan case said. So just as a little refresher. So we're gonna use this as a way to think about legal analysis, okay? So you are a defense attorney in the county public defender's office. Your client, Jack Smith, is charged with possession of cocaine. When police arrested him, they believed he swallowed two balloons of cocaine. They waited 12 hours and forced Smith to take two laxatives, which caused him to excrete the balloons. You must argue that Mr. Smith being forced to take the laxatives violated his 14th Amendment. So using the IRAC method, you're going to argue in favor of Mr. Smith that the police violated his 14th Amendment, okay? So remember, we're gonna start with our issue. We're gonna state our conclusion as our issue. We're gonna summarize the facts. Then we're going to state what constitutional amendment and court cases uh, we're going to use in our argument. And then we're gonna make our arguments and then we're gonna restate our conclusion. So I introduction, R rule, um, A analysis, C conclusion, IRAC. 
So this is the method you're going to use. So think about it. What question is the court trying to answer? So when you look back, what are you trying to answer? So you're going to state it as conclusion. Since you're the defendant, you're going to argue the police violated Mr. Smith's rights when, and that's going to be your issue, and then summarize the facts. Then for rule, you have to think about what constitutional amendment is being talked about. So if you look back, I even give that to you right now, okay? And then you need to think about were there any court cases that we talked about in class that would either be analogous or distinguishable from the facts of this case? So I gave you a hint, I gave you Roshan. So we're gonna use Roshan. So that's our rule. Our analysis is then going to be applying that to this case. So since we're gonna have to decide, is it analogous to Roshan? And therefore they should have the same decision in Roshan or is it distinguishable? Well, since we're arguing for the defense, we're gonna argue analogous because we also wanna say this is unconstitutional. And then we're going to restate our conclusion. So this would be my sample answer. Forcing Mr. Smith to take laxatives violated his 14th Amendment rights, and therefore all evidence obtained from this procedure should be excluded from trial. In this case, police forced the defendant to take laxatives to force the defendant to excrete balloons. So I gave my statement, forcing him violated his Eighth Amendment, and I gave a little summary of the facts. And then I'm going to say what rules they were using. So if police procedure shocks the conscience of the court, it violates the 14th Amendment. So we're going to say what the 14th Amendment says. And then we're going to say our court cases. In Roshan, police stated that forcing a defendant to regurgitate medicine was shocking and violated the 14th Amendment. So we're just going to say which amendment and which court cases we're using. And then we apply it. This case is analogous to Roshan. In this case, the defendant was forced to take laxatives to excrete balloons. This is almost identical to forcing a defendant to regurgitate medication. Since forcing vomit is a violation of the 14th Amendment, so is the police actions. Okay, so uh, this is also shocking like the police actions in Roshan. And then we restate our introduction as a conclusion. Therefore, the evidence from forcing the defendant to take laxatives should be excluded from trial as a violation of his 14th Amendment, okay? So this is hard. This is a really hard process. It's We have to get our mind thinking a very specific way. It's one of those things, the more you do it throughout the class, you'll get better and better at it. It's just something you have to practice. So just to make sure that you get it, that you understand, I want you to practice it, okay? So one thing to remember though, there may not be an exact right argument. You could argue that Roshan is analogous and therefore it's unconstitutional. If you were arguing for the state, you could argue it that it's distinguishable and therefore it should be, this one should be okay even though it wasn't in Roshan. So both can be correct because we are a dual party system. We have prosecutors, we have defense, but we want to argue all of our stuff from a defense perspective. So make sure that you're always looking at it from a defense perspective, okay? Now, I want you to try this. So unfortunately this week you have one more additional assignment because I wanna make sure you get this legal analysis process down because we're going to use it even again later this in this week of work. So I want you to read the government control of physician aided a suicide legal analysis that I posted under the assignment tab. And I want you to write up your legal analysis. So I'm going to let you pick either side. Are you for um, allowing assisted suicide or are you get against it? You will see that I gave you a bunch of the laws already. So you're going to pick and choose the ones that fit the argument that you're making. So you'll state your issue, whether you're for or against that assisted as suicide, you'll pick out the rules that apply, that you think apply, tell me which rules you're gonna use, the cases in the constitution, if there is one. And then you're gonna give me a passionate argument of why those apply in this situation. And then you're going to re, um, 
state your conclusion. So make sure in your analysis part, you're using words like precedent, analogous, distinguishable. Use the terminology that we learned in class. Now, what I'm gonna do with this is I'm gonna grade them. And then if, I, if you're not getting it, I'm gonna send it back and have you redo it. Cause I really want you to get this method down really firm in your head. So then when we keep going through the case studies, um, you'll understand the process. The key word for today's lecture is IRAC, I-R-A-C, IRAC, that's your keyword, thanks. Okay, so one of the things I wanna talk about real quick now is actual procedural law. So we're gonna use legal analysis as a skill that we're going to use throughout the whole semester. So now let's learn some procedural law that we can use it in, okay? So one of the things that we have is this quote, the culprit goes free because the constable blundered. That was people versus DeFore, okay? So the, con the culprit goes free because the constable blundered. Think about what you think that means. So my question to you then is, when police violate people's constitutional rights, procedural rules, constitution, what should be the consequences or the remedies to the victim for those violations? So if police violate your rights, what remedy should you get for their violating your rights? Or what consequences should exist to police for violating their rights? So prior to 1914, the only real punishment to police or remedy to victims was civil action. So the police would actually have to uh, be sued and you would have to try to sue and win money against the police. It was a very, very hard thing to actually win, okay? But now there are much more serious consequences since 1914. So let's talk about those consequences. Let's talk about how they came about. So the first court case that ever came about is Weeks versus U.S., okay? In Weeks uses versus U.S., the police were investigating, I believe it was fraud, mail fraud. And so the police go in and they search Weeks' house, they search all over, and they find a bunch of stuff illegally. They had no warrant, they had no probable cause. So Weeks goes to the court and says, wait a minute, they are violating my fourth amendment right against search and seizure. Other than me suing them, there should be dis additional consequences. Not only should I be allowed to sue them, they should not be allowed to use this evidence against me at the trial. And the Supreme Court agreed. And the Supreme Court said, if, if police obtain evidence illegally without warrants, with, with a violation of the constitution, then anything that they obtain through that search cannot be used against the person at trial. And this became known as the exclusionary rule, okay? And this still exists today. So now on top of being sued civilly, what happens to police is that the, all the fruits of their labor, their hard search and all their evidence, it all goes away. And now we may not have enough evidence against the defendant to actually convict them at trial. So if you think about the different police procedures that exist, so we have stop and questions, we have arrests, we have searches and seizures, we have interrogations, and we have pretrial identification. So these are all the different procedures we're going to learn throughout the semester, okay? So now we need to read our scenario in weeks, which one of these did the police violate? The police violated the search and seizure with illegal police action by searching without a warrant. And therefore any evidence they obtained during that search and seizure cannot be used to convict weeks at the trial. So whatever police procedure was violated, then that evidence cannot be used against the defendant, okay? So all evidence found during that search would be excluded. 
Now, there are a couple situations when the exclusionary rule does not apply. So although you cannot use the evidence against them at the actual trial, we are going to allow you to use it in some other proceedings. So grand jury proceedings, just to determine if we're going to press, uh, continue on to trial, we're gonna let you use it there. We're gonna allow you to use it in a habeas corpus petition. So that's when you're in jail already and you want to argue that you should be let out. We're gonna let them use that evidence against you there. Um, parole revocation hearings, if we wanna revoke your parole, we're gonna let them use it there. And then in some civil actions, but you cannot use it in the criminal trial, okay? Now, one of the things that's important to remember is Weeks was a federal case with federal law enforcement officers. So this was not state police officers, this was federal. So when this law was created, it originally applied to federal law enforcement officers, okay? Oftentimes the Supreme Court will create a new rule like the exclusionary rule. And then you're gonna see a whole variety of court cases that follow after this. And they'll have to clarify this rule. And that's exactly what happened in the Weeks case. We had the Weeks case, but then we had all these other cases that followed after. So we need to talk about some of those court cases. So the first one we're gonna talk about is a uh, Silverthorne Lumber Company versus US. So in Silverthorne, it's a little different. So they thought that the company was cheating on taxes. And so they went into Silverthorne Lumber Company and took the tax records without a warrant. This is a federal officers again. So they take them and Silverthorne says, wait, 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 you said in weeks that if they take, took evidence illegally, you couldn't use it. So they have to give it back. And the prosecutor said, okay, we'll give it back. And the prosecutor photocopied it, gave the original back and just kept the photocopies. So now the Supreme Court had to decide, can they use that and any evidence they derive from those records against Silverthorne at trial? So then we have to ask ourselves, is the Silverthorne analogal, analogous or distinguishable from Weeks? So Weeks said, bad search, can't use it. So Silverthorne is an analogous or distinguishable. Well, I would argue it's analogous. Bad search, can't use it. Silverthorne, bad search, can't use it. But the court went even further in Silverthorne and expanded the Weeks rule even further. And what the Supreme Court said is not only can you not use the evidence you found during the search against the person, you cannot use any evidence that you derived from that evidence. So any evidence that you obtain from it, you also cannot use. And they call this the fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine. So think about walking through a meadow and there's this beautiful tree with all these apples on it. And you're with your sweetie and you're like, let's go grab an apple. So you go to grab an apple and somebody goes, wait, 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 wait. that apple is poisonous, don't eat it. Are you gonna pick one up off the ground and eat it? I would hope you'd say no because that apple was derived from the bad tree, right? So since it came from it, you're not gonna use it. The same concept applies with Silverthorne Lumber Company. If the initial evidence is poisoned, any evidence that comes after it is also poison and you cannot use it in court against the defendant, okay? So view this as a tree with poisonous apples. You wouldn't eat the apples on the ground for it. So think of an example in criminal procedure law. You arrest somebody and you, you want them to confess. So you beat the crap out of them until they confess. That's a bad confession. We will not allow that as a confession. But during that bad confession, you told me where the body was. So now, even though it's a bad confession, okay, we'll get rid of the confession, but we're still going to go get the body and all the evidence off the body. Court says, no, 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 you're not using the body either because it is poisonous. It was poisoned by the bad interrogation. So you're also not using the body or any of the evidence on the body. Okay. So let's think of our procedures again. Stop, question, arrest, search and seizure, interrogation, pre-trial. So let's just assume that they fell in this perfect order in our scenario. So at what stage? Did the bad thing occur? 
there was a bad search, right? So they went and got a bad search. And then let's say they interrogated him after that and did a pretrial lineup. This is the bad thing. So this is excluded under Weeks, the exclusionary rule. But under Silverthorne, everything that followed after is also excluded because it was poisoned at this point. So everything that follows after is also poison. So here's just some examples of when poisonous fruit would um, be used. So if you call force of confession, the confession is thrown out and anything obtained from that. You arrest somebody without probable cause and then they confess after the arrest, the confession is thrown out as fruit of poisonous tree. Um, you arrest a suspect without probable cause. Then they tell you the names of two other co-conspirators. Those are also thrown out because they are fruit of poisonous tree, okay? So think about this example. Officer Paul searches Citizen Q's house based on a warrant. He finds five pounds of cocaine. After Q asks his lawyer, Officer Paul asks Q if there might be other drugs in his home. Q says, I might as well tell you there are other drugs in my car in the garage. So then they go to the garage, they search the car, find heroin weapons and seize all of them. Would it all be admissible or not? If any is excluded, is the exclusion based on evidence illegally seized, weeks, or is it silverthone fruit of the poisonous tree? So we have to start at the beginning of the scenario. So the officers go in and they do a search, but they have a warrant, so that's good. During that warrant, they find five pounds of cocaine. That's good. So when's the first time they do something bad, okay? So we know that they searched, then they arrest, interrogation, and then they searched again, okay? So they searched, found the cocaine, they arrested him. They ask him questions after he asked for an attorney, that's the interrogation. And then they go to the garage and search again, okay? So when does the first bad thing occur? After he asks for a lawyer, they ask him questions. That's an interrogation. So the first search is okay. The arrest is okay. The interrogation is bad. So the interrogation itself and him admitting that he has stuff getting thrown out, okay? But under Silverthorne, so the interrogation and the statements he made, that's the, the thing that will be excluded under the exclusionary rule. And then the further search that they do based on what he said, the other guns and controlled substances, the search of the garage and car, that is also out because it only was done based on what he said during the interrogation, okay? Now, one thing I wanna point out, Weeks and Silverthorne are both federal cases. So they were federal officers, federal cases. So think back about incorporation that we talked about last week. Does the state also have to follow the exclusionary rules, federal rule, federal court case? Do the states have to follow it? And that came up in another case, Matt versus Ohio, okay? In Matt, the police knock on her door, this is one of my favorite cases, and say, we think you're hiding a bomb maker in your house. And she says, bug off, you're not coming in, you don't have a warrant, I'm not letting you in. So the police, state police sit out and stew. I can't believe she's not gonna let us in, okay? So they wait a couple hours and they show up and they have a piece of paper and they flash it to her. Warrant, and then they push in. And she kind of tries to grab it and shove it down her shirt. They wrestle her to the ground, pull it out and, sit, and don't let her look at it. They search her house and the only thing they find is porn. But it's 1961, so having porn is against the law. So they find this porn, okay, and they arrest her. She challenges and says, bad search. You did not have a warrant. The state says, we don't have to. That's a, that's a federal law. This exclusionary rule you're talking about, that's federal. We don't have to follow it. The court said, yes, you do. So the exclusionary rule is incorporated at the state level. So you do have to follow it. All local, town, village, state, police, also have to follow the exclusionary rule, okay? Now, if you want a further explanation, I have a video, Matt versus Ohio explained video. I'll give you a little more detail about the facts of the case. It's pretty cute, it's short. 
but it will give you a good overview of what happened in that case and you can watch it. Now, when you think about it, there is a large percentage of defendants who were not charged with the crime because they were released because of violations of the exclusionary rule. So what if that came true? I'm not saying it's true, but what if research showed that? Would you still be in favor of the exclusionary rule if it starts to um, allow guilty people possibly to go free? Do you still like the exclusionary rule? So there are different reasons for the exclusionary rule, okay? So justifications, there are violations of the constitution and we should never allow anybody to violate constitutional rights. They're the most fundamental thing in our government. So if you violate it, there should be consequences. Number two, we need the courts to uphold constitutional behavior. So by following the exclusionary rule, it keeps integrity of the court and people's rights. And the last reason is it's deterrence. If police know they're gonna work super hard and then their evidence is gonna be excluded, it may deter them from wanting to do that. But there are also social costs for this, okay? There are social costs because if police do violate it, the evidence gets thrown out and some criminals may go free. So this is a competing thing. Is it good? Do we want it because it will deter unconstitutional behavior by police? Or is the social cost too high by letting potential criminals out to commit more crime? So that's gonna be your discussion this week. You're going to look at the pros and cons. Now I posted a bunch of articles for and against and different points. You can pick and choose which ones you wanna read and review, but you're going to have to review both sides of the article, art, argument and decide where you stand. Is the social cost too high for the exclusionary rule or should we in fact still have the exclusionary rule? So with this lecture, you have two things. You gotta do the um, legal analysis problem. Do that as soon as you can so I can grade it and get it back to you so you know you're doing it right. And then you're going to participate in this chapter 10 discussion. What do you think of the social costs of the exclusionary rule? Do you like it or don't? So make sure you do the legal analysis because then in the next lecture, we're gonna actually take that analysis and start using it to do some exclusionary rule case studies. Okay, so that is the first lecture. Hopefully you understood. I think I spoke fast, I apologize. Hopefully you can slow it down, stop it, and if you need to. If you have any questions, please raise, reach out to ask me. Um, I'm always available to answer any questions. Thanks, and I'll see you at the next lecture.